of these cells, dendrites coming out. And both of these cells are projecting into the brain. They form part of the optic nerve, project to the brain. And so he recorded from these two cells and they're firing. Now, this mouse at this time has over 100,000 of these cells. We're recording from these two. What about all the other ones? So to get a picture of what the other ones do, we do, instead of recording from cells, we do, a cat, we do an imaging of the cells of the entire retina, or a good chunk of the retina, to see what happens. And what you find is something quite amazing. And I, I think there's a movie. Maybe it won't work, but let's see. Let me just try this again. Mm. What I was going to show you, uh, excuse me? You, you want to try? Maybe you should come out of PowerPoint. I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe it's not that, but it's actually, it's actually quite an amazing thing. So what you see is this. If, you, if, you're, if, you're, if you're imaging the entire retina, what you see is, what I just showed you is called an activity. But what you see is a wave of activity, like a, like a wave, it's called a retinal wave, sweeps across the retina, in one direction, okay? What the heck was that? Now you wait for. Go, it's the other way. Can you go backwards? Yeah, I think it's just. I think it's worse. To yeah, but well, that's. In that mode, if you do. For, may I have a question? In line? Okay. Yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, there is no relation between the frequency of the spikes uh, with the temperature or background uh, radioactivity, for instance. I'm sorry, uh, it's temperature and what? Uh, background radioactivity. Background radioactivity. I don't know about radioactivity because we, we, we try to avoid radioactivity. So so we don't look at radioactivity. With temperature, uh, yes. So these are... Oh, yeah, that was it. Okay, so now let me just get to this. So here's a, an area. Here's an area of the retina that's about two by two. And what you'll see is, if this works, is a cloud going across this. Okay, so it's just background activity. See that cloud? That's thousands of cells firing. Keep your eye on that. Now, this is five times real time. Okay? You're looking at this thing, nothing, nothing, nothing. Five times real time. Speed it up. Now watch this in a second. There'll be another one. What? Well, I'd be Boom, see that? Do you, you see that dark thing going across that way? That, that dark the cloud? That's thousands and thousands of cells firing action potentials. This is imaging with a calcium a calcium imaging dye. No, no. What? See that another one? It's random across the retina, these waves spread. See that? Did everybody see that? It's an amazing thing because it, about every five minutes it happens or so. And it varies, okay. This is just background activity, nothing, nothing, nothing. There's no light here, you know, not stimulated by light. There's no photoreceptors. There's another one like that. And these waves occur during a specific period of development when connections are being formed in the brain. So now going back to your question, radioactivity, I don't know because no, there's, there's no reason why we test that. But, but with temperature, yes. So what happens is these are done in body temperature, normal body temperature. If you lower the temperature, the waves uh, become much slower, much slower in frequency. Yeah. But a lot is known about these waves. There must be, a th must be now a thousand papers written about them. And, and we, we've, you know, we, we've, we've looked at these in, uh, in mouse, uh, in ferret, in fetal monkey. That happened when you were in, in utero, when I was in utero. They just spontaneously start like that. So, so my, uh, my first point is do no harm, because if you do harm, you can impact a number of things, not the least of which is this electrical activity that's important for refining connections in the brain, and then the connections are not what they normally should be. So the baby is born at a disadvantage rate. The second thing that is absolutely certain from the uh, uh, data we have, including the work of two Nobel Prize winners in my field, which I'll tell you about in a minute, is, and this has had a major impact on how children are treated in American hospitals, and I assume here as well, shortly after birth, correct sensory impairments at every possible time. So here is about 3% of the babies in the world are born with this condition. That's called amblyopia. You see this eye? It's deviated. Like so. That's a pretty serious de deviation. Sometimes it's slight, just which is hard to catch. Here's what happens. That eye 
will not be properly stimulated during the early development. And then when a child goes to school and they can't read well, they try to correct that. They find they cannot correct it when anything. And the reason is this, that because this eye is not getting proper activity during development, the connections of this eye to the brain are completely disconnected. Completely disconnected. It's like the function. Not just functional. Anatomically, they shrink to about one one hundred of what they should be, depending on how severe this is. This was this was first discovered working on cats and monkeys by David Hubel and Torsten Weasel, uh, who won Nobel Prize for his work at Harvard Medical School. Hubel died about a year and a half ago, and Torsten Weasel is still alive. He's in his uh, late eighties now. Okay, and so as a result, now when a child is carefully examined and has any kind of deviation of that, they correct it as soon as possible. Because if you wait, it's too late. That brain is functionally and structurally disconnected from the visual centers of the brain. Nothing you can do. And as a result, a lot of effort has been made into testing children for vision. So here's one. A woman called Davida Teller at the University of Washington in Seattle developed this very simple you know, we talk about computers, high tech, this and that. You know, everybody's into that. Uh, Facebook uh, <laughs> and all the other stuff. Like that. this is something that simple costs five dollars to make. Yeah, it's been cited thousands of times in literature. So here's what what uh, Dr. Teller uh, did. She wanted to test what the kids see when they're first born. They don't see the way the world the way you and I see it. So she gets a mother. That's the mom. That's the baby. She has the baby look at this, and here's what the baby sees. That's the baby looking. And the baby sees either stripes like this on one side, here's, the, here's where the baby's first pointing on this thing, or nothing. What happens? Babies like people like to look at something as opposed to nothing. So when this comes on, sometimes it comes on here, sometimes it comes on here, the baby's eyes, not it's holding it, looks over the stripes, okay? Because there's nothing to look at here. And so what she does is, or actually a graduate student does, is changes the frequency of these stripes, more stripes, higher spatial frequency, and thereby determining the acuity of the baby, okay? At some point, the frequency of these stripes is such that the baby can't tell the difference between this and this, in which case it's looking as random. So they're able to do exactly what an optometrist does, except better, because spatial frequency is a bit. So you and I, under optimal conditions, you know, if your vision is perfectly corrected, can see 40 stripes per visual angle. 40. Light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, like that. A baby can see much less, and so, so here's the kinds of things she, she was able to get. Okay, so this is the spatial frequency vision of babies. From one, one of age, okay, they can, they can barely see, like the acuity per cycle degree, barely half a cycle per degree. So what that means is when they're looking at you, they just see like a blur, a blur. You know, it'd be like your eyes like that. And rapidly, look, first year, Spatial acuity gets better and better and better and better and better like that. Up to, you know, uh, four years of age when it's really kind of reaches almost adult limit. So the first four years of life, the spatial acuity of the baby is improving, improving, improving. And with this kind of graph, a mother can take her baby to the clinic and say, where does that baby fall in this thing? Here or here or where? Okay? So you notice know, if it's abnormal or not, it's abnormal, how do we fix it? By the way, these studies have also, on the visual system, have also been used. So every baby born in a teaching hospital in the United States is immediately tested for hearing. They put a little cap of electrodes, and they provide different uh, earphones, they provide different frequencies, and they look at that, and they can immediately tell you in 10 minutes, usually eight minutes, if the baby has normal hearing or not. If the baby doesn't have normal hearing, they do what I told you. In, Fix it as soon as you can. They implant electrodes into the cochlea. That baby's hearing will be perfect. Language will be perfect if they get it very early. So about 1% of the babies in America are born with impaired hearing. 
those babies would have poor language and you know and would have and would have hearing problems and not being totally deaf for life. They can now do that. Not just can you hear or not, but do you have a hearing impairment by giving different frequencies and recording brain waves? So that all came out of these studies on the visual system by Hubel and Weasel. Now this is something before these studies were done. This is actually a, a picture from the New York Times many, many years ago. Before these studies were done, so that we knew that activity in the two eyes was absolutely essential to have the normal connections. So this is a picture that they had of a boy, this little boy, who fell and hurt, bruised his eye all around here. So they patched the eye. So now he doesn't get normal activity through his eye. They're actually making this eye disconnected from the brain by patching this eye. And by the way, two, three days is enough to make a change during a certain period of time. So he patched his eye. So this kid, of course, doesn't like it. So what he does is rips the patch off. So what they do is they put these arm guards on him. So not only are they disconnecting his eye from his brain, but they're also giving him sensory deprivation of his arms as well. And this is like a cute picture saying, oh, look, you know, how Tommy tries to outsmart the doctors, but the doctors are smarter than him, so they put this thing on his hands so he couldn't rip the thing off. Okay, so that's all, they, they never do that anymore for the, for the reasons that I just showed you. Okay, so the third thing is, and I think this is something most parents know, is optimal periods for learning do exist and should be taken into account in designing learning programs. And so, you know, so there are, uh, used, to be, used to be called critical periods. These started, this, the idea of critical periods actually came from uh, uh, work done by an animal behaviorist, uh, Conrad Lorenz in Germany. And this is, what, this is him, he won a Nobel Prize for this. And what he found, by accident really, is that if you have ducklings follow you a certain part after ha hatching, they treat you like the mother and they follow you everywhere. They ignore other ducks, okay? And it's, and it's just a certain period of time. And so he, here he is with these ducks going out. Now they're adults, 